Good morning, Crosspoint family. Hope you guys are doing well this morning. As we spoke about last week, uh, the elders and I are in conversations about what reopening may look like. And so as soon as we have a plan to move forward with that in terms of like a date and what that will look like, we will be communicating that to you. So just giving you kind of a heads up and keeping you in the loop of some of those conversations that we're having. This morning, I've asked my friend Bill DeChilly to uh, read our call to worship this morning. And so let's lean in and hear um, the word of the Lord. Call to worship this morning is from Psalm 77, verses 11 through 20. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O oh God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea. Your path through the great waters. Yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Spirit sounds and misty song, 
Over the last several weeks, we have taken some time to check in and hear from the missionaries that Crosspoint is in partnership with. You guys, this morning, we have the great privilege of hearing from our dear friend, Laura Morgan. Laura is on staff with Surge, uh, formerly known as World Harvest Mission. And as you begin to hear Laura share this morning, you will also begin to hear that we have a very personal connection with her and her family. And so Laura and Steve and the rest of your family, we love you very much. And so we're excited to hear from you this morning. Good morning, Crosspoint community. My name is Laura Morgan and I serve in a global capacity with Surge, caring for and equipping missionaries and other ministry leaders around the globe. I'm saddened not to have been present with you in person already, but I'm joyful to be present with you today. This paradox of sadness and joy is actually something that I find myself holding a lot these days, both for the ministry leaders and the missionaries that I care for, and for myself and my family personally. And so I wanted to share just a little bit about each one of those and give you some specific ways to pray. Uh, my ministry with Surge has two groups in focus, um, missionaries who are Surge missionaries and ministry leaders who are both Surge leaders and non-Surge leaders. Uh, I do this as part of two different teams, Surge's member care or missionary care team and Surge's renewal, gospel renewal team. So the, the care that I give is spiritual, it's emotional, it's practical and logistical. So it ranges amongst all those. In any one given member care conversation, for example, we might talk about family struggles, visa requirements and processes, team conflict, um, and uh, how COVID-19, for example, impacts all of those things. And the base of it all is always the conversation of spiritual um, struggle in the middle of things and uh, where where our struggle is to believe that God is who he says he is and um, that we have all that uh, we are told that we have in Christ. And, and so we're talking about those things in the midst of all the other difficulties. Um, this week alone, I've engaged with individuals or families serving or preparing to serve in 11 different countries. Uh, much is beautiful and rewarding about missionary um, and ministry uh, leader life and calling. Uh, not everything is hard about ministry, uh, but ministry is hard. And often these missionaries and ministry leaders are incredibly isolated now more than ever. Uh, they put themselves in places of great risk and vulnerability. And so they have a vital need for safe places, for soul care, and for practical assistance. Uh, and that is the work that I get to do and that you partner in. It's a deep, deep gift to do it, and I'm grateful uh, for your partnership in it. A couple of ways that you can pray. I would say, please pray for workers as they do navigate COVID-19 restrictions and its impacts. We have medical workers in remote villages of Africa just beginning to experience the spread of the virus and without some of the medical advances that we have here in the West. We have workers in Europe and South America who have spent long months in apartments on severe lockdown with young children who are just beginning to even be able to venture outside. And they're gonna feel the impact of that for some time. Um, we have workers who are fully funded and unable to actually depart for their new places of ministry. Workers who had to evacuate very quickly and unexpectedly for various reasons. Uh, and other workers who made the decision to stay knowing that they would have no option for travel even um, in, in the case of needing to care for an aging parent or something like that. So very difficult decisions and um, difficulties, and that's just a small part of the impact of COVID-19. So please pray for these workers and please pray for my member care team and for me as we seek to care for them, not just related to COVID-19 issues, but in the complex issues that we face every day with them. Uh, I think the greatest testimony that I can give uh, to Surge's commitment to caring deeply for its people and the need for it, and to your participation in that actually, has been in the care that my family and I have received um, out of deep need over the last eight months. Uh, as many of you know, my husband is pastor of Grace Foothills Church in Tryon, North Carolina, a church that you're 
own pastor actually planted. Um, and in September, we experienced the tragic and um, very excruciating loss of our 19-year-old son, Aiden, who was an App State student. Um, it has been um, unbelievably difficult. Uh, and as a member care worker, I can say that we, we have experienced the deepest level of care I could imagine. And Surge has lived out its value of caring for its people in my life. And I tell my workers that all the time. We've also experienced this deep care from our church and from our supporting churches, uh, including you. And from you in very specific ways, as you have prayed and as you have on multiple occasions um, released uh, your own pastor to care for us in our congregation, to conduct our son's memorial service, um, and in multiple other ways, including caring for students who were close to Aiden. Uh, we're deeply moved and sustained by this care. We continue to grieve, to heal, to cling to Jesus, um, but it's hard and we need your continued prayers. In the midst of that, we await the birth of a granddaughter. There is joy. I'm filming this in her nursery in Alabama, awaiting her arrival. Um, and so would you also please pray for our family as we await her birth and for our daughter, Emma, and for baby Blair and her arrival in the world in this next week. Uh, I am uh, grateful for you. You're near to my heart. I'm thankful for your partnership. I'm thankful for your care. I'm thankful for the beautiful way that you invest in students at App State. Uh, I pray for you and I look forward to being present with you face to face soon. Let's spend some time uh, together in prayer. Uh, you guys, this would be a great time for you to um, to continue just to, to adore him and worship him, to confess uh, sin, to um, rest in his forgiveness um, for you and his acceptance for you. Um, this is also a time uh, to pray for our country. Um, this has been a rough week, especially for uh, the city of Minneapolis. And so, um, it feels like the fabric of our country is coming apart. I wasn't alive in 1968, but from what I've read and seen, this is beginning to feel like 1968. Um, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. And so um, let's pray that he raises up peacemakers in cities all across our country, uh, here in our community too. Um, let's pray for the churches, specifically in Minneapolis. Let's pray that they are a window of grace and um, that they are an agent of healing uh, for the people who live there. Um, and obviously, so much more going on uh, in the country and in the world with the pandemic and the loss of life and the loss of jobs and um, people's fears. Um, let's pray that Jesus does an amazing work during this season um, that we're alive. We're witnessing history. And so let's pray that Jesus goes after people with his tenacious and redeeming love. So I'm going to give you a moment um, silently before him, and then I'll pray in just a moment.
Father, um, our heart breaks um, as yours does. Um, when you, when we and you look at what's happened um, in many of our cities this week, um, the tenderness and compassion and justice of Jesus just leaps out and wants to just say, Lord, please come quickly. And so, Father, we pray. Um, it's really even hard to know what to pray for, but we pray that you would, you would work um, in the midst of the brokenness of what we've seen and witnessed this week. We pray for our own hearts, Lord, um, that you would help us to be people filled with empathy and understanding. Um, Lord, that you would help us to be <clears throat> just ambassadors of the gospel, that we would represent you well. And we pray that you would bring healing um, to the city of Minneapolis. You bring healing to the family of George Floyd. Uh, you would bring healing to that community. Um, and Lord, we pray um, for our time in your word. Uh, this is such an amazing passage, an encouraging passage. Um, help us to, to just soak in it and, and watch and see the way that you save. Um, so Lord, we uh, pray for the Holy Spirit to um, awaken our hearts and minds and imaginations to what you have to say to us through Exodus 14 and 15 this morning. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, transitions are hard. So here we go. Um, perhaps you're familiar with the oft said phrase, God helps those who help themselves. George Barna, uh, he's a well-known pollster. He wanted to know what Americans thought of that phrase. And so here are his findings. 53% uh, of Americans agree strongly with that statement. 22% agree somewhat. 7 per C, sorry, 7% disagree somewhat. And then 14% disagree with that statement strongly. So I would encourage you guys to be in that 14% disagree strongly group. Why? Because this passage that we're about to look at this morning, Exodus 14 and 15, and actually the whole rest of the Bible actually shows us that God helps those who cannot help themselves, uh, which is what God's grace is all about. God helps those who help themselves is actually, it's the default mode of the human heart. We so often redouble our efforts, or we try harder to be better in the attempt to win God's forgiveness and his favor and his acceptance. You guys, that is not the message of the Bible, um, and it is not the gospel. As Tim Keller often says, religion says, I obey, therefore I am accepted. Christianity says, I'm accepted, therefore I obey. That's how grace works. That's how the gospel works. And so this passage that we're going to look at is an amazing reminder of what God's redeeming grace actually looks like. And so this is going to be our last time in Exodus, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, next week, we begin our summer series in the book of Philippians or the epistle to the Philippians. And we chose that because Paul was in quarantine, um, kind of. I mean, he was in prison while he wrote this letter and the letter is full of joy. So uh, we'll start Philippians next Sunday. 
So here we go, this morning, previously in Exodus. So Pharaoh lets the Israelite slaves go after this 10th devastating death plague. And as the Israelites are leaving, and by the way, we're talking about millions of people here. As they are leaving Egypt, God sends them the long way home, uh, guided by his presence in the pillars of cloud and fire. That's where we were last week. And so Pharaoh realizes that his entire labor force is gone, and so he gives an order to his soldiers to go after these people. And so the Israelites are trapped because in front of them is the Red Sea, this impassable sea. And then behind them is this army, this Egyptian army coming after them. Um, in the midst of the chaos, Moses, and this is where we left off last week, Moses says to the people, this is in chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, this is kind of when he just, everyone's panicking, they're freaking out, and he just kind of puts his hands out, and he, well, this is my vision, he just kind of goes, everyone just stop and listen. And then he says, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. And so with that statement, um, we see one of the most miraculous and mind-blowing acts of redemption in all of Bible, all of the Bible, the parting of the Red Sea. So I've asked my friend Aaron Larson to uh, read our passage this morning. And uh, just a heads up, this, I've, because this story is so good, um, I've asked him to read the entire story. And you guys, it's, it's a longer passage. And so um, I encourage you, don't tune out. Um, go get your Bibles and open them to Exodus chapter 14 and just kind of read along with Aaron as he reads uh, this story to you. So he's going to be reading Exodus 14 verses 15 through 31. And then he's going to jump over to uh, chapter 15 uh, verses 19 through 21. So let's lean in. Uh, to what God's word says to us this morning. And you guys, I really do encourage you to like, just place yourself into the story. Um, it's so good. And so let's uh, listen to God's word together. This is Exodus 14, 15 through 31. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land. And the waters were divided, and the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. 
Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, and they believed the Lord and in his servant Moses. And then from Exodus 15, verses 20 and 21. Then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, so I just want to pull on two threads uh, from this passage this morning. And the first thread is this that God's salvation is always anchored in his grace, like his, un his unconditional grace for his people. So we're gonna pull on that thread. And then the second thread at the very end, uh, how do we respond? Like, how do we respond? What's an appropriate response to God's salvation by grace alone, okay? So that's where we're gonna go this morning. So first thread. God's salvation is always anchored in his grace. So uh, you guys, during the, um, the Reformation uh, in the 16th century, and you guys, this was like this unique period of time. Uh, this is all in Europe. Um, this unique period of time where uh, people were uh, being reawakened. They were rediscovering the gospel. And so um, during that time, like slogans were being developed um, to help people remember, like wh what was it that these guys, these reformers were teaching and saying? And so guys like Luther and Calvin. And so um, think of the way that we use bumper stickers on cars, right? You put your bumper sticker on your car. You, you want to communicate something to the people behind you. And some of us, let's just be honest, there are bumper stickers that are not helpful. Um, <laughs> so in the Reformation, during the Reformation, uh, these bumper stickers were being developed, these slogans to kind of communicate what was being taught and what God did during that time. So for example, the bumper stickers of the Reformation can be summarized in what has been called the five solas of the Reformation, and they are <clears throat> Scripture alone, Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone, and God's glory alone. And so all of those, uh, those five solas, um, all of those fit nicely here in what we see uh, and hear about in Exodus 14. God is the one who is saving these people and he does it by grace alone, through faith alone, and for his glory alone. God is the author of salvation. So what does God do for these people? He opens up an escape route. We may never know uh, precisely the crossing, like where the crossing of the Red Sea took place, but we, we do know how it all went down. So look again at verses 19 through 22. It says this, Then the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. And then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land. And the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right and on their left. Okay, wow. Lots of questions. First of all, did this really happen? Like, is this, isn't this the part of the Bible where we're like, okay, like this is like a fable. This is 
a parable. This is not to be taken literally. Like, isn't that the part of the Bible? That isn't, isn't that what we're supposed to do with stories like this uh, in the Old Testament? Like, is this what we would categorize as like a legit miracle, like a supernatural occurrence that this body of water split into two so that these people could walk across dry ground? Like, imagine if you're at Price Lake or Bass Lake, you know, some of the lakes around us, and all of a sudden the lake was parted and um, you were able to cross Price Lake without walking around it. Um, is that what's happening here? Like, are we really supposed to believe that God parted the Red Sea, that this is an actual miracle? Uh, skeptics have given like two arguments against the possibility that what we're reading here is some sort of supernatural occurrence. And one of the arguments is that they just say, this is just, this was merely like a little weather event, like a, a, a wind and a low tide. So they say that. And then the other argument is this, that they would say, the skeptics would say, this is not even the Red Sea. This is the Reed Sea. In other words, they're saying that this was like a, a marshy land, a marshy area, and um, it was low tide. And so there might have been six inches of water. Um, you guys, the way that this is written, uh, and remember the, the genre that we're talking about is historical narrative. Um, the way that this is written down is telling us that this actually happened. Plus, um, the, all the Egyptians drowned in this story, which would have been hard to do if it was just six inches of water. And people are still talking about this redemptive act, like redemptive act, like 3,500 years after uh, the, this event has taken place. Like even Bob Marley has written a song about this. Um, again, we, we've said this a lot. Uh, the God of the Bible is, he's crunchy, right? Um, he's not a tame lion. And he, he is going to push against our sensibilities, and he invites us to believe the unbelievable. Okay, let's keep going here. So look at verses 23 and 20 through 25. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea. All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel. for The Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. You guys, by this point, the wheels really are starting to come off. Mm, so sorry for the pun. By the time the Israelite army said, let's get out of here, it was too late. And they knew that they had lost this battle and they knew who won. And so Pharaoh and his army must have thought, like, how in the world did Moses and his God get the best of us? The most powerful human army in the world is now at the bottom of the Red Sea or dead on the shore, on the other side. Look at verses 30 and 31. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, so the, so the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. You guys, uh, again, God is the author of salvation. So let's, let's bring this down kind of to the street level of our hearts. Um, and let me ask you this question. Do you struggle with this idea that God reaches down and he saves you, he saved you with absolutely no effort on your part? Like, let me encourage you here. God saves because that's who he is. That's how he's wired. 
and he will never uh, cast you out. Not ever. I've been reading um, a book during my devotional times in the mornings uh, by a guy named Dane Ortland uh, called Gentle and Lowly. Uh, and listen to what he says here. Uh, this really struck me this week. He says, we cannot present a reason for Christ to finally close off his heart to his own sheep. No such reason exists. Every human friend has a limit. If we offend enough, if a relationship gets damaged enough, if we betray enough times, we are cast out. The walls go up. With Christ, our sins and weaknesses are the very resume items that qualify us to approach him. Nothing but coming to him is required. First at conversion, and a thousand times thereafter, until we are with him upon death. All, all of this here in Exodus 14 uh, points us to a bigger story, a, a, a much larger salvation than what these people experienced. And so when Jesus arrives in his incarnation, one of the themes of his ministry was this, someone who's greater than Moses is here. And so the gospel says, Jesus is like the true and better Moses, who comes to redeem a different kind of slave. Again, uh, we're just like these people. Uh, we can't save ourselves. We're hemmed in on all sides. In front of us is our sin. Behind us is our enemy. And there's only one way out of danger, and it's not up to us. And so we need a mediator, we need a redeemer, we need a savior. And in Christ, we get one. Rather than being slaves to a cruel human dictator like Pharaoh, we are slaves to the cruel oppression of our own sin. And in the person, in the person and work of Christ, we've been set free from the bondage of sin through his death and resurrection. Like on Good Friday, we were slaves living on like the west side of the rest, the Red Sea, uh, deserving the judgment of God. But on Easter Sunday, now we're like liberated people living on the east side of the Red Sea, free from the penalty of sin, free from judgment. Why? Because Jesus passed through the waters of judgment for us. You know, that statement that we began with, God helps those who help themselves, that statement just falls apart. It just does. When you step back and you look at what God has done, kind of the big, big picture of his redemptive acts to save people who couldn't save themselves, who can't help themselves, um, that statement just falls apart. Like, like I'm, I'm going to go up to Jesus and say, hey, let me, let me, this whole salvation thing and this whole redemptive thing, let me give you a little hand with that. Like, like I'm going to say to him, oh yeah, you lived this perfect life and you died the sacrificial death and you took on the wrath of God and then you conquered death. That's great. Uh, hey, if it's okay with you, let me just add in like some of my good works. Uh, you know, like walking an elderly person across the street, which by the way, I've never done, but you get the point. Let, let, let me add in some of my good works um, just so that we're square. No, that's, that is not, again, that's not the gospel. That is not the message of the Bible. That is not grace. Um, God does what we cannot do. He saves us when we cannot save ourselves, and then we respond to him through the gift of faith, and then we also respond to him through actually obeying him, uh, because that obedience now is coming out of a place of gratitude and love. But here's the thing. Um, you guys, we're not in the promised land yet, and the promised land being um, we're not on the other side. We're not in heaven. We're not in the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, we're on this side of eternity. And we live in this tension of the now and the not yet of our salvation. 
which means that even though we're united in Christ and the penalty of sin has been dealt a mighty blow, the presence of sin still remains. And I, you guys, I'm not talking about, I'm not only talking about the presence of our personal sin, but I'm also talking about the presence of like corporate sin. In other words, not only am I broken and in constant need of his redeeming grace, but so is everyone around me. And that includes people and that includes systems. This past week, as we prayed earlier, this past week was a hard week in our country, especially for our African-American brothers and sisters. And let's just be honest, the past 400 years, um, th there's just been this dark cloud um, for our African-American friends in this country. Another black man uh, died this week, uh, George Floyd. In this heartbreaking and gut-wrenching act of injustice, being choked to death by an officer's knee on his neck. And while so much progress has been made over the last decade for racial justice, we still have a long way to go. And as one writer said, um, an African-American writer on the Gospel Coalition website, he said this week, America still has a race problem. And even, even those of us who are united in Christ through faith, you know, a race problem is a sin problem. And you guys, perhaps now more than any time, we need the kindness and the gentleness and the long-suffering patience and the justice and the love of Jesus to melt our hearts and shape us into the kind of people that he wants us to be, like lovers of God and lovers of other people. And that lovers of other people doesn't matter what color of skin or where they're from, what their ethnicity is. It doesn't matter because this piece of, of the, com the greatest command, right? Love the Lord your God. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself. This piece is true and right because every human being is made in the image of God. And so you could disagree with them. You could, you know, you could hold different political views. You could hold different moral views, whatever. Like, but we are to love people. And we're to be compassionate and tender and gentle with every human being. Like, you guys, grace and truth go together. And you cannot separate the two. Like, you, they have to go together in the way that we relate to our friends, to our neighbors. Um, Crosspoint needs to hear that. Boone needs to hear that. Um... The people, our governor needs to hear that. The people in D.C. need to hear that. The people in Minneapolis need to hear, see that and hear that. Um, you guys, a, a, a Christian, someone who follows Jesus, struggles deeply. Struggles deeply. But at the same time, a Christian, someone who follows Jesus, is headed somewhere. And this story in Exodus 14, seen through the lens of the gospel, seen through the lens of grace, tells us that our greatest enemies, which is sin and Satan and death, our greatest enemies are already dead on the seashore. And now we live on the east side of the Red Sea because Jesus' exodus secures ours. And when that quarter drops, 
our hearts will ache for Jesus' healing and transformative grace in our lives and the lives of other people. So how do we respond to all that? Like, what's an appropriate response? Again, like this is, um, I credit Matt Howell uh, with this line. Like when someone saves you or saves someone that you love, you don't just look at them and say, hey, could you pass me the salt? Like, <laughs> what is an appropriate response to someone who literally saves your life? Well, these people, they all break out in song. Uh, Moses did it in Exodus 15, and then Miriam, his sister, also does it at the end of chapter 15. So look at what Miriam, look at Miriam's response. This is uh, chapter 15, verses 20 through 21. It says, Then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron and Moses, uh, took a tambourine in her hand. Like a tambourine. How cool is this? And all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. You guys, many times a song, a poem, it's the only way that we can express how we feel. And that's why we love music the way we do. Um, this is Miriam singing, We Are the Champions by Queen. Or better said, God is the champion. Remember, he's the author of salvation. He is the one who defeated this army on behalf of these people. And you guys, God in Christ, he has thrown the horse and his rider into the sea for you. And so when God works his grace into our hearts, the only way, um, the appropriate way to respond to him is through worship. Is worship, it's singing, uh, singing back to him what he has done for you. And so that's why uh, we sing each week. Um, so as we close, uh, what are you singing about this week? And you guys, as we have been talking about uh, this whole service, um, this has been a rough week in our country, and this has been a rough several months in our country. And sometimes, sometimes it's appropriate to sing songs of lament, songs of like sad songs, um, the blues. But don't forget that it's okay to sing the blues because the psalms are full of them. <laughs> But the gospel also always promises hope and renewal and love and grace. It's, it's both, right? You can't just look at God's story and say, well, that's, that's a sad, stinky, yucky ugh, story. Because sin, my sin, these people, it's prevalent all over the scriptures. And then God continually enters himself into the story. And when he does, it does then produce like songs of praise and songs of hope um, and songs of joy. So um, Ellie Holcomb has, she wrote a song uh, called the Red, I think it's called Red Sea Road. And um, enter kind of, Take your story, wherever, whatever that is this week, um, and kind of insert your story into this, to this story, and insert your story into this story in Exodus uh, 14 and 15. So let's listen to this together, um, and then I will uh, close us out in prayer. Grave, but everything reminds. 
we will sing to our souls. We won't bury our hope where he leads us to go. There's a red sea road when we can't see the way. He will part the waves and we'll never walk alone down a red sea road. How can we try? You say you will deliver us from all of this pain that threatens to take over us. Well, this desert's dry, but the ocean may consume, and we're scared to follow you. So we'll sing to our souls, we won't bury our you for stories like this. Thank you for preserving stories like this. Whatever we're going through this week, I pray that you would help us to see your grace and your salvation in our lives. And Lord, if we're listening to this, uh, if we stumbled across this YouTube channel and we don't know you, we're, we've never experienced uh, our hearts being changed and transformed by your grace and love. If, if there's someone who's sitting there, and even if they, they, they could be a, a person who's been around Crosspoint for a long time, and they might be sitting there going like, I, I don't even think I'm a Christian. <laughs> uh, Lord, would you... Would you um, reach down like you did here in Exodus 14. And would you save that person? Would you convert their heart towards you? And um, there is mystery in salvation. We acknowledge it. Um, I don't understand how I'm even sitting here. I don't even understand how I'm a pastor explaining this passage to my friends this morning, but you, you acted and you initiated and you moved and we respond. So Lord, I pray for um, my Christian friends who are listening and they feel maybe a little sleepy in their faith. Um, I pray that you would use um, stories like this and books like the one I'm reading this past week 
to reawaken uh, their love for you. And Lord, help us to move out um, to love other people, to get out of our comfort zones, um, to actually serve and love uh, our community, our neighbors. Um, I pray that you would do amazing things uh, through uh, the people of Cross Point in our community, all by your grace. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. receive the benediction. This is from Romans chapter 16. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith 
To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. We love you guys, and um, we will see you next week.